We had two self-portraits of Henri Fontaine Latour. And the next one. So let me make the introductions in that painting. Seated at the easel is Edouard Manet. Above him is Otto Schauderer, who was a Belgian painter. Framed by the frame in the background is Pierre Auguste de Renoir. Next to him is J'accuse, Emile Zola. Mm -hmm. Then between him and Basile, you have met who was a writer, and then the tall guy with the funny pants is Basile, who was one of the impressionists. And then right behind him, it's off screen, but this is Monet. And then in front, seated on the chair, is Zachary Astruc. And the reason I put it in number 19 position is to remind you of the importance of Manet as a path breaker. Manet is the guy who really um, changed everything. And he was the one who supported and helped the Impressionists. And uh, that position here as the center of that group at that time is very uh, revealing of what he did. And I would like to quote Gauguin who said, painting begins with Manet. Not since Giotto had an artist so truly deserved the epithet of revolutionary. Indeed, it was the state of painting instigated by Giotto in the 14th century, often modified, but never questioned, that Manet overthrew, creating a new one, modern painting. And the next one. <coughs> And in number 18 position, I have a painting by Edouard Manet. The next one. And I picked it, not because it's a fantastic painting, but I picked it for the story. It's a great story. <laughs> and the story has to do with Edgar Degas and Edouard Manet. They were, let's see, let's say, uneasy friends. Uh, everyone was an uneasy friend of the guy. He was a very difficult guy to like. The next one. So he had been invited by Manet, and uh, he decided to do a painting of Manet in his apartment, listening to his wife, Suzanne, playing the piano. So he did a very beautiful painting. When he came back three weeks later, he noticed, and he was absolutely upset, that Manet had cut out part of the painting, removing the face of his wife, <laughs> because he felt that Degas had done a very bad job at it. <laughs> Degas took the painting, was furious, and left in a half, and then sent back to Manet a painting of Manet that he had acquired before. Manet, the next one, decided to do the real face of Madame Manet. And she was, by the way, a very good pianist. Now, this is a pretty good painting. It's not the greatest in the world, but there is something in the painting that is quite remarkable. Uh, Manet was not a great draftsman, as Degas was a great draftsman. Manet was someone who was a master with a brush. His, uh, the quality of his brushstroke was of the highest order. And if you look at these hands of Suzanne Manet, they are moving. Can you show the next one? Now, when you look at them side by side, you can decide which one you like, or at least you will have the last part of the face of Suzanne Manet. <laughs> now, I'm showing you this uh, uh, image simply because I want to show you the quality of the brushwork by Manet. Look at the tips of the asparagus, all done with a light brush, and it's absolutely exquisitely done. Now, it was a commission. And the man who commissioned that painting when he received it was so pleased that he sent more money to Manet than had been agreed upon. Upon which the Manet <laughs> decided to do another little asparagus, send it to the collector with a note, sorry, I forgot one. <laughs> that one, by the way, is in the show. And it's the tiniest painting in the show. Now, look very carefully at the, the tip of the asparagus when you are there in front of it, and then you will see just how exquisite that brushwork of Manet is. Next one. At number 17 position, we have a pretty amazing painting by Claude Monet. And Claude Monet 
had few patrons when he first started. He struggled for years. But one of them was Ernest Oshde, who was absolutely amazingly wealthy. He has castles and so on. And this is a painting that he commissioned uh, Monet to do. He did not tell him exactly what to do, but he asked him to come to his uh, castle and then to paint the garden of the estate and so on. And there happened to be some white turkeys. And so Monet did a fantastic job at these white turkeys. Now, you have to look at the painting in person to really appreciate the brushwork that you have in that painting. The brushwork is amazing. Uh, it's moving in every direction. You look also at the overall composition. It's almost like a musical composition with the turkeys being like notes of music. And then if you also look very carefully, what's the color of the white turkeys? Are they any white has been used? It means if you get very close, you will see that only any white has been used in these white turkeys. That's amazing that they look white to us, mm. but Monet was playing with the refractions of the light and so on. And was the white there painted white or was that just the canvas? What do you mean? So did he use white paint to make it the white? He didn't just use the there, there is some white paint, but most of the paint is light blue, is light okay. yellow and so on. Uh, now, for the rest of the story, as you are looking at the details of uh, the turkeys, uh, Monet uh, received a number of commissions from Oshde, but Oshde finally uh, had a better eye for art than he had a head for business, and he went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. He and his wife, Alice, uh, had been very nice patrons for the Monets, and at one point, probably something happened between Monet and Alice. Uh, one of her children, and she had six of them, uh, was thinking throughout his life that he was the son of Monet. Uh, eventually, Oshde went into exile in Belgium, and uh, Alice uh, and uh, Monet joined forces, and uh, the two of them had together eight children. And uh, finally, when uh, Oshde uh, died, uh, a number of years later, they got married. And it seems that when Alice died, she died before Claude Monet, uh, Monet could not work for a year. Uh, that's the depth of his love for Alice, and she was a remarkable woman. But that's the rest of the story on that piece. The next one. At number 16 position, we have a work by Alfred Sisley. When you talk about the Impressionists, you talk about the four musketeers of Impressionism. You have Renoir, you have Monet, you have Sisley and Pissarro. Now, Monet made it after years of struggles. He made it very big, but he struggled for at least two decades. <coughs> Renoir, after years of struggles, made it and made it big. Uh, Pissarro, after years of struggles, made it. Not big, but he made it. Six later, never made it. <laughs> when he died at age 60 of cancer of the throat, he did not have enough money to pay the doctor. And about three, four months after his death, his paintings were selling for over 400 times what he had been paid for. That was very sad. His idol was Cobo. He absolutely loved Coho, and Coho was the dominant influence in his life as an artist. So you have, of Coho, that long perspective. You have also, the, and above all, the beautiful musical uh, quality of the tones. That was what Sisley did. His paintings might not be as spectacular as the paintings of Monet or Renoir, but if you take the time to get into that music of the tones, you are going to discover a fantastic artist. Now, this one is called Le Chemin de la Machine, uh, the road of the machine, because you have down the road, that's in Louvciennes, you have down the road the machine that was commissioned by Louis XIV to bring uh, water, to pump the water for the fountains of Versailles. Still there, still works. The next one, number 15. 